Newfound Lands, the Indian landscape from empire to freedom, looks at landscape painting in India over a period of 200 years, from 1780 to 1980. We start with British artists who travel to India from the late 18th century onwards in search of the picturesque, in order to find out what they were looking for and how they understood and represented what they found. We then move on because in the schools of art that were established in India in the middle of the 19th century, there were new teaching methods and new materials which encouraged some Indian artists to adopt a naturalistic approach to landscape. They mastered an academic style, but at some level were also learning to see the Indian landscape through Western eyes. By the middle of the 20th century, a reaction set in as some Indian artists rejected the need for naturalism and sought new modes of expression. In a way that seems to parallel the freedom movement itself, they reclaimed their patrimony and the right to represent it, inventing a glorious array of new landscape styles. British professional landscape painter to work in India was William Hodges. Um, he arrived in 1780. His intention was to make images of Indian landscapes and buildings primarily for the benefit of audiences back at home in Britain. It's hard for us now to imagine this because our world is saturated with images, but the British public at the end of the 18th century had no visual idea of India at all, in spite of a long association of trade and so on. Until Hodges got here, no one had seen real landscape paintings of, of India. So Hodges had to represent Indian architecture in ways that made it more accessible or comprehensible to Western viewers. And we see some of the consequences of that in this magnificent image that he made of the gateway to Akbar's tomb at Sikandra. He made this print as an illustration to a dissertation that he wrote on the prototypes of Indian architecture, in which he argued that the Islamic form of architecture is closely related to the Gothic, and therefore something that Western audiences should readily understand. But in pushing that connection, he makes certain distortions to the forms. So for example, you see the form of the arches in this building as he's drawn them have a sort of pinch at the top. This is not actually there in the building itself, but known as an ogee, it is a very common feature in Gothic architecture. Similarly, the sort of ruined porch to the side through which this mysterious light filters is an entirely fictitious added element to make the building look more like a ruined Gothic abbey. Another aspect of the picturesque is that it takes a very scenic approach to architecture. Buildings were regarded merely as a component part of the larger landscape. And you see that very clearly in this view by William Hodges of the great temples at Dioga, where the towers of the temple are shown in a cluster, but then shrouded, half covered over in the trees and vegetation around them. This combination of architecture and landscape would be readily understandable and accessible to Western eyes. But I think in an Indian context, it's a little disturbing because the emphasis is so much more on the form of the buildings rather than on their function or their purpose. And in a way, this rather understates the sacred nature of the site. Just a few years after Hodges, another great British landscape painter, Thomas Daniel, arrived in India and he, with his nephew, William. And they toured all over the north and down the south as well. And also, like Hodges, produced scenic views of landscape and architecture. They sought out dramatic landscape effects like waterfalls and so on. Again, there's a problem about the Western interpretation. The Daniels knew very well that in an Indian context, waterfalls are often sacred sites. In his journal, written as they traveled, William Daniel complains repeatedly about the hordes of pilgrims who are always getting in the way when they're trying to draw such a scene. But when you turn to their images, where have all the pilgrims gone? In this drawing, there is a single lonely ascetic sitting by his fire, but everybody else has been erased so that the artist can concentrate on what a Western audience wants to see, which is the dramatic landscape feature. Elements of the natural world feature in Indian art from the Ajanta murals onwards. But up until the 19th century, most Indian painting was 
either sacred or courtly in nature. And in that context, the idea of the pure landscape could not arise. By pure landscape, I mean a landscape that is observed and represented only for itself, for its own visual appearance, rather than to serve as the setting for some courtly or religious narrative. But then in the 1850s, the colonial government set up new schools of art in the big cities, Bombay, Calcutta, and Madras, where students were taught in a Western academic style of drawing, and that changed everything. One artist closely associated with the Bombay School was M. V. Duranda, and we see the impact of his Western academic training in this very lovely oil sketch, A View of Distant Hills, where the focus and emphasis is on the atmospheric and lighting effects of landscape. An artist who came just a little bit later was L. N. Tusker. This beautiful little sketch, watercolour drawing, shows a group of people milling around in what is in fact the courtyard immediately in front of the Taj Mahal, a space known as the Jilokana. In the background of the picture, we glimpse the gateway which leads into the market area known as Taj Ganj. Uh, he has beautifully delineated the forms of the building, but also with death strokes captured the billowing garments of the characters standing in, in front of it in the courtyard. It's very skillfully done, it's an accomplished work of art, but there's nothing really to distinguish this work from something that might have been done by a Western artist. Evidently, that did not trouble Ellen Tusker, and indeed, the teachers and students of the Bombay School were very adamant that the Western academic style was just seen as something, an aspect of modernity rather than something foreign. Some artists in Calcutta took a rather different view, particularly those who followed the banner of Abhinindranath Tagore, where they saw the westernization of art as something of a sellout, something inconsistent with their nationalist aspirations. And they strove rather to stress the spiritual nature of Indian art as that element which made it distinctive. But not all of them. Varesh Wasen was obviously a Bengali and started out as a student of Abhinindranath. But he met the Russian artist, Rurik, who introduced him to the Himalayas as a wonderful subject for painting. And this had, was a turning point in Sen's career. From then on, he produced landscapes in a miniature format. His watercolors like this one are very rarely more than a few inches, few square inches. And yet he succeeds in conveying the immensity of nature in this very compacted space. So we've seen how by the early 20th century, a new genre of naturalistic landscape had emerged in Indian painting. Around the middle of the 20th century, some artists began to question the need for naturalism in landscape art. You might think it's obvious, naively, we might think surely the point of painting a particular place is to show it and share it, to capture some distinctive aspect of it and communicate that with the viewer, but no. Some artists thought you could treat landscape like any other subject, not as a thing to imitate, but as a source of inspiration in creating new forms, forms that were self-referential rather than referential back to the world. I think they were influenced in part by global trends in modern art, including abstraction and expressionism. But I think there were other things going on there too. These artists were people who were born before independence in what was still a colonial state, but lived to see India attain freedom. And at the same time, in their art, they were experimenting much more freely. So for example, let's look at Gopal Ghosh, who produced a large number of vividly colored watercolor landscapes, like this view of a village amid trees. I like this one particularly because of a certain ambiguity, the very warm, orange and brown hues seem to convey that the village is somehow protected and yet at the same time it's menaced by the greys and black above. So this painting is more about mood than about place. Is it in fact even a real village or just something that Gopal Ghosh has imagined? <laughs> 
Some artists carry their paint boxes and easels out into the fields to capture atmospheric effects on plain air. Gopal Ghosh, I suspect, constructed his landscapes out of half-remembered, half-invented fragments of landscape. This small oil painting by Kisori Roy does show a real place. As the title tells us, it's a view in the Kumaon Hills. And if you're an enthusiast of Kumaon, you might feel that you recognize some distinctive quality of the region. The artist has constructed a pattern of interlocking curves. Our eye is led on a sort of roller coaster ride over the outlines of the hills along this path that meanders through the center of the painting, along the top of the wall, and around the furrows of a plowed field. This work is not about documenting Kumaon, it's about using Kumaon as a source of inspiration to create a new formal pattern. Finally, we come to this large oil painting by Ganesh Haloy, who is one of a number of Indian artists who pushed landscape towards abstraction. It's no longer about recognizing real places in the world. It's at best about recognizing elements of nature. So we can say that there's a depiction of rocks and water here, but much else about this painting is puzzling. The artist deliberately teases us, teases the eye, as we try to figure out matters of scale and depth, only to conclude that we can't. This work was painted 200 years after the drawing of rocks and water by Thomas Daniel that we saw earlier. But despite the similar subject, this represents a very different vision of landscape. We've moved a long way from topography to a landscape of the inner mind.